Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a 5-Minute Friday on Hunky Vape. It's October 16th, 2020, and this is your 5-Minute Friday Vaping News and Advocacy Report. Our first report comes from The Guardian, Trinidad and Tobago. For those of you not familiar, Trinidad and Tobago is the southernmost island country in the Caribbean known for its fossil fuel wealth. For those of you geographically handicapped, this island is located just off the northern tip of South America. Smoke-free products are the future. Cigarette smokers and TNT will one day be able to get their nicotine fix in a healthier, smoke-free way. What are they talking about here? They're talking about Philip Morris's ICO system, Heat Not Burn. And they're basically doing their political maneuvering in order to get the government to allow them to sell these products in these two countries. The uh, ending of the article is posted here. It says, um, we understand and support the objectives of the TNT government to curb smoking. However, Philip Morris International supports reasonable tax measures that strike a balance between achieving public health goals and ensuring that adult consumers do not turn to black market products instead of legal ones. Evidence has shown that disproportionate tax increases could result in the acceleration of the illicit trade, which is already a growing issue in TNT. It's already a growing issue across the world because of the increased taxing that is being done on not only tobacco products, but on tobacco harm reduction products. There's a link going to be in the comment section below in the description of this video if you want to continue to read the rest of that article. Jumping over to Yahoo Finance. The re tobacco regulation is now more fully in the hands of the FDA. Yeah. This article, once again, is talking about the pre-market tobacco application process. After a long wait, the Food and Drug Administration finally has control over the regulation of products like e-cigarettes, hookahs, and cigars. A 2016 Judge District Court ruling stated that companies first marketing deemed tobacco products after February 2007 are required to submit a PMTA application in order to remain compliant, but they had until September of 2020 to do so. Of course, everyone waited until the last minute. Despite the vastness of the industry, only 1,451 products have been submitted as of August 20th. Well, the author of this article is wrong. Looking at the FDA's website, there's been 1,451 applications submitted. A lot of these applications contain a lot of products because if a single tobacco manufacturer produces multiple e-liquids in multiple strengths, those are all included in one application, not filed as a separate application for each individual product. Yeah. Currently, an estimated 400 million products are required to submit a PMTA, which inv involves extensive documentation, including evaluations of health effects on both the general population and the individual. This is one of the complaints that everybody had about the PMTA process and how ridiculous it was. Not only do you need to take and submit scientific study and data about the users of your products, you also have to submit scientific studies on the people that are not using your product. Environmental impact, statements of all components, ingredients, and operation methods, descriptions of the process of manufacturing, packaging, distribution, proof that the product meets established standards, samples of your product, examples of labeling, and anything else that the FDA deems necessary to determine whether the product is going to be compliant or not. We talked about this before, and I've talked about this on numerous occasions. The voluminous nature of the PMTA creates serious challenges for an expedient review process. In other words, it's not going to be possible for the FDA to be able to look at all these applications in the course of the next 12 months. What's going to happen? Yeah. 
That's going to be very interesting because nobody really knows. It will be interesting to see how this sector of new tobacco products fare and how well the FDA will manage to regulate this industry. One thing is certain, however, companies that have committed to the rigors of filing a PMTA for their products are more cognizant than ever of how to look out for their customers now and in the future. I'll tell you what's going to happen. You've got a black market that's starting to grow and will continue to grow. Because one of the things that is pointed out in this article is that the FDA does not have the manpower or the resources not only to process these submitted applications, but also begin enforcing these rules and these applications on all 400 million products that are still on the market today in most cases. <sighs> Jumping over to tasteyourjuice.com. Vaping news, Philippines. Bloomberg and CTFK funding Philippines FDA. Yeah, big surprise there. Michael Bloomberg throwing his cash around to get prioritized treatment for what he wants. The House leader in the Philippines, House of Representatives, has pushed for an inquiry into funds accepted by the nation's Food and Drug Administration. This agency is responsible for the approaches to vaping and other non-tobacco alternative nicotine products. The FDA acknowledged that it has accepted donations from two organizations, the Union and Bloomberg Initiative. Effectively, this means all of the funding comes from a single source, billionaire Michael Bloomberg. The Union co-manages the Bloomberg Initiative to Reduce Tobacco Use Grants Program, which is a partnership with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Tell me if this isn't 1984 in its fullest form. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids is funded by somebody who's trying to make money off of supplying tobacco products to consumers. Yeah. Let's look at the article link here. The original article where tasteyourjuice.com got its information is Planet of the Vapes. Your author of this article is David Cross. Bloomberg's war chest is probed. Yeah, very, very appropriate title for this article. Association Vapors India said these international NGOs directly fund government departments and state tobacco control programs, which shouldn't be allowed as money received directly from private entities creative Massive conflict of interest. While India moves to tighten FCRA laws, these foreign NGOs and their local grantees have broken and continue to break existing laws. One of them, Burning Brain Society, is filing court cases with this money, which violates FCRA norms. So entrenched is this cartel that when a government official questioned this foreign funding, he was promptly booted out and the bar on the errant NGO was quickly lifted. Emboldened, these foreign NGOs are now proposing highly discriminatory policies like banning less harmful alternatives in developing nations, but not in the West. Yes, in countries where harm prevention is vital, because most people have low access or no access to health care. This is where they're performing these backroom deals to get what they want. Global Nicotine Consumer Umbrella Group, INNCO, commented, We decry the use of undisclosed financial inducements and lobbying designed to pressure foreign governments into enacting draconian tobacco harm reduction laws. Interventions on health policy driven by unilateral convictions of a billionaire anti-tobacco harm reduction zealot is corrupt and undemocratic. So why is uh, Michael Bloomberg doing all this? Well, let me remind you of an article that was published last year, September 24th of last year. Michael Bloomberg is one of the people who are trying to push for their own product. Hava Health is about to launch Hale, which TechCrunch referred to as the first vaporizer 
designed for smoking sensation. Yeah. All vaping products are technically smoking cessation products. The reason is because they're five times more effective than any other nicotine alternative out there on the market today. So what is Michael Bloomberg doing? He's pushing to take his vaping device and getting approved as a big pharma product so that he can wipe out both the vaping industry and the pharmaceutical alternatives, the pharmaceutical nicotine replacement therapy options. This device reeks of big pharma, but wait, there's more. Have a Health has some big name backers that include Village Global, Backstage Capital, Hardware Massive, and other angel investors on their website. One name that stands out as part of this was a network on Village Global website and is no one other than Michael Bloomberg. The same Bloomberg that donated $160 million to anti-vaping efforts in New York, as reported by the New York Times. Uh-huh. Campaign for tobacco-free kids. Where did it get some of its money from? Michael Bloomberg. Why? Because he wants to wipe out vaping so that his Hale product will be the only product on the market available to you if you want to quit smoking. Oh, the truth butter flowing today, let me tell you. Let's go back to the planet of the vapes and take a look at another article. Reduced harm for the homeless. Also published by David Cross. Homelessness is strongly correlated with the propensity to smoke and engage in risky smoking behaviors. Many researchers who have spoken about the benefits of vaping have highlighted how the homeless community faces huge difficulties with accessing reduced harm products. Clients in Manchester's homeless hotels have benefited from a targeted approach to help them switch. Well, the summary of this is basically they've done multiple research studies about the homeless and about the fact that we take for granted that we have access to batteries and charging and electronics and even just basically electricity to charge these vaping devices. The homeless have none of that. So, especially with the COVID situation out there, a lot of the homeless have been gathered up and put into literally hotels that are sitting abandoned because of COVID, and the government is basically housing the homeless. Well, while the homeless are being housed there, that's a perfect opportunity to do a scientific research study. So what do they do? They ensured that all devices had closed pod systems so that they were secured to operate and also served to provide reassurance to the support staff and hotels who were working with the residents. We delivered on-site training to the support team workers based in the hotels, as well as sending our own staff members who initially handed out the devices to the clients and provided them with operating instructions. With the right tools and support, these alternatives to tobacco can be a powerful and accessible way to help address a health concern in one of the most vulnerable communities in our society. Tobacco needs to be treated as seriously as alcohol and drug use. As the exit strategies get underway for moving residents out of their temporary accommodation, we want to be a part of those discussions and promote the wider smoking cessation work that is going on across Greater Manchester. We have asked that this nicotine management and smoking cessation work is included in individual care plans for service users who have been in the accommodation. And where accessible, we will continue to provide support as we move into longer term housing arrangements. The homeless community have been overlooked for a long time. If we are going to make lasting impact, we need to be looking ahead to the future and making plans to deliver ongoing support Yeah. Tobacco harm reduction is something that they are working literally hand over fist in the UK. They accept the fact that vaping is at least 95% safer than smoking deadly combustible cigarettes. They want these people to stop smoking. They want to provide whatever tools are necessary for them to do that. And the homeless and the disparaged in society need a little bit of extra help. Vaping empowers them to do that. But we take for granted the fact that a lot of these devices, we change batteries out of them when they need to. 
they don't have that opportunity. They need devices that are going to be able to last and last and then are obviously going to be replaced because it's always going to be cheaper for you to hand them these nicotine alternatives, these vaping devices, than it is for you to pay for the healthcare costs associated with these people. The healthcare costs that are directly from smoking cigarettes. Well, let's jump to our next article, Vapor Round. I uh, mentioned this earlier too, PayPal. That's their next avenue of attack. Payment processing may not be the most glamorous of topics, but in the world increasingly driven by online shopping, it is of vital importance to independent businesses. The most prevalent and well-known name in online payment industry is PayPal. Its installed user base is now so large that losing access to PayPal can become a huge problem for an online vendor. Well, what has PayPal been doing? Hmm. Up-and-coming British e-liquid manufacturer Supergood fell victim to their confusing and punitive process policies this week when their merchant account was frozen along with all the funds in their merchant account. They received no prior warning from PayPal. We heard from other businesses that something was happening, but no communication from PayPal whatsoever. PayPal reserves the right to close any account without notice. On the face of it, this may not seem unreasonable, but what happens to be legitimately earned money in the account closed by PayPal? What happens to it? It's frozen for up to 180 days. And this is extremely troubling for independent businesses. Cash is king, and holding any small business's cash is detrimental to their ability to run, especially in the, today's day and age. Freezing the funds of any independent business is problematic at best. Under the current economic climate, just one interruption in cash flow can spell doom for a small outfit and the employees who rely on that living. What's more, PayPal's terms of service are murky at best when it comes to vapor products. There's no mention of tobacco products in the standard user agreement. However... Businesses can apply for pre-approval to sell non-cigarette tobacco products, e-cigarettes or prescription drugs and devices through PayPal's acceptable use page. You can forgive smaller companies for not being able to divine the true rules of PayPal when they're so unclear. It's pretty sad you need a team of lawyers now to be able to operate a business. And it's companies like PayPal who have become these super, mono, you know, Super giants. It is their prerogative to do as they wish. And these small businesses are falling so aside because of it. So this is going to be their next avenue of attack. PayPal is going to randomly start, um, you know, drilling in and drilling down on those people and those businesses that are selling vapor products. And what's going to happen if you're one of the consumers you submitted your payment to them. It's going to get held up for 180 days while they figure out what to do. What's going to happen to the business that you ordered the items from? They're waiting for your money. Are they going to ship you your products and take it as a loss? And hopefully, you know, it is all confusing and it is becoming riskier and riskier to sell products nowadays. And all this is going to do is it's going to grow the black market. Yep. Pennsylvania seizes $1.7 million in illegal e-cigarettes. This comes from VaporVoice.net. More than 86,000 unapproved vaping products worth an estimated $1.72 million were intercepted on the way to Lehigh Valley in eastern Pennsylvania by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. The shipment from China arrived September 18th in the United States, identified as LED lights, and addressed to a location in Northampton County. Instead of lights, the shipment actually contained 216 boxes of about 86,000 Alpha One Plus flavored electronic cigarettes. Flavors included Mojito, Apple Blue Raz, Strawberry Milk, Energy Drink, and Pomegranate Strawberry, according to the story in LehighValley.com. Well, what happened? Customs and Border Protection officers in the port of Lehigh Valley in Allentown detained the shipment and contacted 
the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Because, see, this came in and was delivered right after the PMTA requirement went into effect. Earlier this month, the FDA examined the e-cigarettes and determined that they violated the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act as being misbranded consumer goods being imported by an unauthorized agent. So you have to have authorized permission to be able to import these products. And then the products have to be compliant with the PMTA process. And if they don't have a marketing order, guess what happens? Yup. E-cigarettes will be destroyed. Sorry for your $1.7 million loss. Sad and troubling. Because here's a uh, research study that was just published. October 4th. Pregnant women's use of e-cigarettes in the UK, a cross-sectional survey. Now, I'm not going to actually open up the article or the research study, but I will show you the conclusion. One in 20 pregnant women report vaping. Most also smoke. Dual users are more motivated towards stopping smoking than smokers are. They've already made the commitment to try. Where women have tried but cannot stop smoking, clinicians should encourage them to consider vaping for smoking cessation. Vaping is at least 95% safer than smoking deadly combustible cigarettes. Vaping is safer, alternative, and should be encouraged. Not taxed to oblivion. Not turned into some political ploy so a billionaire can be richer than he is today. It's sad what lit world we are living in. But this is your news and advocacy report for October 16th, 2020. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend. And remember, keep on vaping.